Good evening, everyone. As we advised earlier this afternoon, we have a positive case of COVID-19 in the community. We will not be in a position to identify if this is a case of the Delta variant of COVID-19 until genome sequencing is returned tomorrow. However, every case we have had in MIQ recently has been the Delta variant of COVID. And Delta is surging around the world. While we cannot confirm it yet, we need to assume that our case will be too. And that has shaped all of the decisions we have made this afternoon. Public health officials have been working at PACE this afternoon to gather information on the case and their movements. And I will pass to Dr. Bloomfield shortly to set out the facts as we currently know them, including locations of interest that have been identified so far. But first, I want to assure New Zealand that we have planned for this eventuality and that we will now be putting in place that plan to contain and stamp out COVID-19 once again. Going hard and early has worked for us before. While we know that Delta is a more dangerous enemy to combat, the same actions that overcame the virus last year can be applied to beat it again. I'll now pass to Dr Bloomfield. Thank you, Prime Minister. Kia ora koutou katoa. So just to update you on the details uh, around the community case that we announced this afternoon. To recap, just after midday, I was alerted to a positive COVID-19 test result in Auckland. This case was identified when the person presented to their GP yesterday, Monday, with symptoms and was tested. So, to start with, I want to thank both the person who has tested positive and, of course, the general practice. We can only act on cases if we know they are there as soon as possible. The case is a 58-year-old male from a household in Devonport on the north shore of Auckland. He became symptomatic on Saturday the 14th of August, so the infectious period is considered to have started on Thursday the 12th of August. Importantly, and this has been fundamental to our advice to, to the government, at this point there is no obvious link between this case and the border. Whole genome sequencing has been rapidly carried out at ESR's Auckland laboratory for this case, and we expect to have the results through in the early hours of tomorrow morning. The whole genome sequencing will help us learn about this infection and whether or not it is confirmed to be a, one of the Delta variants we have seen overseas, and it should also give us information about potential links to other cases. You will be aware that every uh, case that we have in New Zealand in managed isolation, the sample goes to ESR for testing, for whole genome sequencing. That's not always successful, uh, but we have a database, of course, of all the previous ones that have been uh, uh, sequenced successfully. So it will help us with our source investigation. In the meantime, as the Prime Minister said, we are assuming this is the Delta variant, as all of the uh, genomes sequenced over the last uh, at least three weeks and in fact all but one since late June have been Delta variant. The person lives with uh, his wife who was also tested yesterday and yesterday returned a negative test. Both individuals have been self-isolating at home until this point. On their earlier movements, the couple travelled by private vehicle on Friday the 13th of August to Coromandel Township and stayed the weekend there returning to Auckland on 15th of August. The case has a small number of workplace contacts who are isolating and being tested. Uh, the man is not, uh, is not vaccinated but was in the process of actively booking his vaccination, had had trouble with the website but had been making efforts to do that. Uh, his wife is fully vaccinated. Uh, I do want to commend the case for being a frequent user of the New Zealand uh, COVID Tracer app, and this tool has helped very. Uh, this has helped very much in helping us speed up identifying locations of interest. We have identified at last count 23 locations of interest, 13 uh, in and around Coromandel Township, and 10 in Auckland. <coughs> I have five of those, which I'll just run through now. These and any subsequent ones that are confirmed will be added to the Ministry of Health's website. 
Uh, these five locations are all around uh, Coromandel. Importantly, the Star and Garter Hotel in Coromandel on the 13th of August, between 6.39 and 7.40. The Umu Cafe in Coromandel on the 13th of August, between 7.40 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. The Star and Garter Hotel in Coromandel on the 14th of, eight, uh, 14th of August, that was the Saturday, between 7.11 p.m. and 9 p.m. The BP Gas Station in Coromandel on uh, the Saturday the 14th between 9.30am and 9.40am and Terrace Beads in Coromandel on the 15th of August between 10am and 10.05am. The instructions for anyone who has been at those locations of interest at the time specified is to immediately self-isolate and call Healthline on 0800 3585 453 for advice about what to do. These locations and others will be on our website, as will be clear instructions about what people are required to do. Now, I should say that there will be people from outside of Auckland and Coromandel who may have visited at, and have been at these locations of interest, the ones that we've identified and subsequent ones. So it's important for anyone who has been in these locations over the last week to check our website and see if they are included. If you are, you are, wherever you are in the country, you are required under a Health Act Section 70 order to follow the instructions around isolation and testing. There will also likely be locations that are en route between the Coromandel and Auckland, so once again, do keep an eye on that information on the Ministry website and we will publish it as, as it becomes available. Further interviews are underway to help establish how this case was infected and further details on his movements. I understand people will be concerned, however, I do want to assure people, uh, both in Auckland and Coromandel and indeed across the country, we are taking the necessary actions immediately to limit the spread of the virus. Our systems have already swung into action to gather up the facts. An important uh, thing, uh, uh, action from here is that we identify, of course, any other potential cases that are out there. So there are uh, testing centres open across uh, metropolitan Auckland until 8 p.m. tonight, so extended hours. All testing locations nationwide are available on the HealthPoint website. There will be additional testing centres uh, across Tamaki Makoto tomorrow, further details, and uh, likewise we are wanting anybody around the country, if they have symptoms at all, to be tested, so all DHBs will be ensuring there is good testing capacity and that is accessible, including extended hours right across the country. The most recent wastewater testing result for the North Shore was on the 11th of August, and that was negative. A sample taken yesterday is being analysed presently, and we will have the results tomorrow. Daily sampling will now be undertaken, and ESR is looking at uh, options for sampling around Coromandel. Additional public precautions, particularly around vis visitors, uh, will be in place, of course, in relevant hospitals. So. This case uh, was identified in Auckland, but it is a national issue. Because we cannot link the case to the border at this point, it is possible there are other cases around in Auckland and other possible chains of transmission. People from around the country will have tra uh, travelled to Auckland and back to other parts of New Zealand. Therefore, whilst it's a, uh, a case identified in Auckland, it requires us all to be part of the response. Hard work from everyone across the country will help us uh, get on top of this uh, outbreak. There's been a huge amount of work already over the past few hours by teams here and in Auckland. There will be people working into the night to carry on that response. Uh, but the health system cannot do it alone, as always, it is together that we will make a difference. Back to you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Dr Bloomfield. As I said, we are assuming that we have a case of Delta that we are dealing with. International evidence and science around the Delta variant of COVID-19 shows that it is potentially twice as infectious and more liable to cause severe illness. As Professor Skegg's report set out uh, last week, with Delta raging around the world, it was experts' view that it was not a matter of if but when. As it is, we are one of the last countries in the world to have the Delta variant in our community. This has given us the chance to learn from others. And while this is a situation no one wants to be in, there are benefits to being amongst the last. 
We are in the position to learn from experience overseas and what actions work and what actions don't work. On that front, Delta has been called a game changer, and it is. It means we need to again go hard and early to stop the spread. We have seen what can happen elsewhere if we fail to get on top of it. We only get one chance. That's why Cabinet has met this afternoon and made the decision that New Zealand will move to alert level four from 11.59 p.m. tonight. Level four will be for initial period of three days, except for Auckland and the Coromandel Peninsula, who we anticipate will likely be at level four for seven days, due to them being most closely linked to our current case. Over this time, we will be looking for testing results from people from locations of interest, wastewater testing, and general community testing of those with cold and flu symptoms elsewhere in the country. Our plan over the coming days is assess if there are undetected chains of transmission elsewhere to track down the source case and to assure ourselves that there aren't other cases in the community elsewhere. We have made decisions on the basis that it is better to start high and go down levels rather than start too low not contain the virus and see it move quickly. We've seen the dire consequences of taking too long to act in other countries, not least our neighbours. Just as we successfully stayed home and saved lives last year, I'm asking the team of five million to unite once more to defeat what is likely to be this more dangerous and transmissible variant of the virus. Now I want to come back to what Level 4 involves, given it has been a year since we used this, the highest alert level that we have. The underlying principle for Level 4 is reduce down contact between people to a bare minimum, essential contact only. That means the simplest thing New Zealanders can do to stop the spread of the virus is to stay at home. Beating Delta means lifting our game. Delta spreads more easily via the air, so physical distancing is even more important. As we've seen overseas, particularly in Sydney, unnecessary trips outdoors have spread the virus and mean communities have not been able to get on top of it. So I ask New Zealanders to please follow the rules to the letter. Let me quickly expand on each of the reasons for leaving your home briefly and some of the common questions that you might have. The reasons for leaving your home under alert level four include physical exercise in your neighborhood, visiting the supermarket, dairy, or pharmacy, necessary medical care, or getting a test. And if you undertake these activities, please wear a mask when you leave the house. Let me expand in a little more detail on each of those reasons for leaving your home. People in the past have asked if they can leave their home for a walk, for instance. Yes, you can. Or to take your children out on their scooters, for instance. But we ask people to stay two metres away from anyone you pass. Stay local and do not congregate. Don't talk to your neighbours. Please keep to your bubbles. It comes down again to those very simple principles. We know from overseas uh, cases of the Delta variant that it can be spread by people simply walking past one another. So keep those movements outside to the bare minimum, wear a mask, and make sure you keep up that physical distancing. The bubble is back. The people in your bubble should be the people in your immediate household or those dependent on you. Once you go into a bubble, you must stay in it and others cannot join. That risks spreading COVID. If you are completely isolated or you live alone, remember you can join a bubble with one other person that you have contact with. It needs to be just you and that person though. You must be faithful to them and they must be faithful to you. Those in those circumstances will remember those rules from our last level four. If you have multiple contacts with others, that is where the risk increases and we cannot afford that. You can drive locally to your supermarket to get food, but again, we ask that you maintain your physical distance, again, to two metres from others who may be undertaking essential errands. And again, please wear a mask. Other than that, we're asking people to stay home. Only shop when you need to. 
And it is preferable that there is just one person per household that goes shopping to reduce any risk of spread, and that they follow the instructions of staff. Remember to always act like you have COVID-19. Stay clear of others. Don't put them in harm's way in the same way you'd expect that they don't put you in harm's way. There will be economic support available. And I will ask Minister Robertson to outline the available measures at the conclusion of this first introductory um, press conference and questions. On vaccinations, we will be suspending vaccinations for 48 hours while we ensure that vaccinations are unable to be take, uh, take place in a safe environment, both for our vaccinators and those who may be visiting. We have currently 40% of our eligible population vaccinated with at least one dose. We want that to continue safely, and when we can, we will. We will provide a further update on that uh, in the next 24 hours. I want to finish by acknowledging our frontline workers. The most important thing we can do to acknowledge their work is to only leave home for the reasons that I have described. I know that one of the worst things about COVID-19 is the absolute uncertainty that it creates, but we know more now than we did a year ago. We know that this strategy works. We know that we are a strong team of five million, and we know that life will get easier. We just need to keep going. We'll both be back tomorrow at 1 p.m. to provide you with an update of all of the information that we have. Till then, Please take care and please be kind to one another. We're happy to take questions. Prime Minister, um, how likely is it that those lockdowns could be extended if you're taking this harder and faster and more cautious response than, than ever? As, as it stands, the decision to go for seven days was because we didn't want to provide for those areas that really are closely linked to this case any false hope by saying it would be a, a short lockdown. At this stage, we don't know. So we wanted to give a clear indication it is most likely to be seven. We keep it under constant advisement. And for the rest of the country, that's why I've indicated at this stage that we're working to three. What was the issue with the case, perhaps you could address this, Dr. Bluzio, what was the issue with the case not being able to um, access the, the vaccine booking system? Just and reported in, that he had an issue yeah. with the website. But again, his wife has been fully vaccinated and he was in the process of doing so. Does that have on how infectious Delta could be, though, because well, mixed well, results on that at yes. the moment. Yes, so he, he was making every attempt to book in his vaccination. He's in that age group uh, uh, between 55 and 60 that has just come online in the last week or two. So I did want to convey that even though he is not vaccinated and I put, put myself in that group, I had my first vaccination booked, um, he was making every effort to, to be vaccinated and indeed, as the PM said, his wife was vaccinated. Method, what is your method? And the one thing that I would also add, yes, we're seeing um, evidence that suggests for that first dose uh, something in the range of 30% reduction in the likelihood of transmission, but it is not 100%. And so that's why vaccinated people should follow the rules like everybody else. We need everyone to play their part here. We've seen over in Australia, we've seen problems with compliance. What is your message to people who question the need for an alert level for lockdown? Australia. We just need to look overseas at what has happened there because uh, of uh, some of the decisions of those covered by those lockdowns, some who may not have necessarily followed the rules, it has essentially extended the period of time that they're there. New Zealand hasn't had that same experience. For those periods we've had lockdowns, by and large, there's been really good compliance. So I just say to, to Kiwis, do what you've done before. We want to be short and sharp rather than light and long. We've seen what happened in Sydney. We don't want that experience here. If we all comply, it lifts our chances of getting out of this earlier. How much more vulnerable is New Zealand because of the relatively or comparably low rates of vaccination? I'll, I'll let Dr Bloomfield touch on that, but you see, even, even some of those countries that have some of the highest vaccination rates in the world are still seeing cases of the Delta variant. So yes, vaccinations make a difference to those uh, hospitalisations and deaths, but it is not the entire answer. Uh, and so that is why I say to people that actually uh, complying with these rules, making sure we can do all that we can to stamp it out, still remains the best strategy in the world that we're in now, even with vaccines.
Just to add to that, <coughs> even if, and uh, you would have heard this last uh, week from Professor Skegg and others, even with high vaccination rates, and one reason for this is, of course, because we uh, uh, there's still a group we are unable to vaccinate, that is our, our, our children and, and younger teens, uh, even with high vaccination rates, we would still need to have a range of public health measures in place. And while we continue to pursue an elimination strategy, where we do everything we can to keep it out, if it does come in the community, our approach is to, of course, go hard to stand. Why do you feel that three days is enough, is safe enough for the rest of the country in terms of lockdown? We've discussed this, and, and uh, uh, there, are, there are some key bits of information we will have in the next three days. First of all, we will have the whole genome sequencing. Uh, and that will allow us to look and see not just where this case may be linked to the border, but potentially how many um, uh, people are between. So if there are any other people between the border case and this person, or whether it's a direct link. The second thing is we will have the results of the further wastewater testing. It's reassuring that our testing done last Wednesday in Auckland didn't show, it didn't detect any virus other than the one that drains the jet park, which happens all the time. Uh, which suggests there's not widespread infection around Tamaki Makoto. Ow. Oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, and uh, the, th the third thing is, of course, is we will have the results of testing of contacts, particularly those people who have been in those locations of interest, and that will give us an idea of if there are, is further spread, particularly from some of those locations. One of the ones I mentioned was a crowded pub on a Saturday night watching the rugby. Those people could be anywhere around the country, and we want to make sure that none of those people are infected. Our starting principle was we are better to start high and be cautious and move out as soon as we have comfort to do so, than start too low and be in that phase for much, much longer. You know, we only need to look at Australia to see the alternative that wasn't an option for us in fact, for New Zealand, it never has been. Go hard, go early has served us well. <laughs> Mikey, I'll let you finish the question your question. Isn't so much that three days is too high or too hard, but perhaps is it not high enough? Is it not hard enough? Why not leave? We're indicating at this point an initial three days. Of course, people will see at our one o'clock press conferences where we share everything that we have. They'll get a sense of whether or not it continues to be contained to those areas that early on we've identified as being areas of concern linked to the case that we've identified. But what we've learned from the past is that actually identifying the source of this case will give us much more information around how much risk exists for the rest of New Zealand. Because we've not yet identified the source, that's another reason for caution. Just people who are around the country, away from home. Um, ah, yes. Thank what, you. Yeah, what, what's, what happens if they can't? Yes, you'll recall in the past that we have given people time to go back to their place of residence if they, for instance, aren't in a position to, to shelter in place to stay where they are. Uh, we're giving a 48 hour period for that relocation, but ideally, as soon as possible, we would like people to relocate. The reason for 48 hours, we learned from the last time we moved to an alert level four, that when we gave a shorter window, there were some people in exceptional circumstances who may, for instance, been at the bottom of the South Island who needed to move up with a vehicle. But again, we want people to move as quickly as they can to where they need to be, but we're cutting off at 48 hours for that movement. Well, it's a, it's been a more Jason. than a year since there's been a, a nationwide lockdown. It has. And since then, New Zealand's been held up as sort of a shining light as a way to combat COVID. How hard was this decision for you and your cab cabinet to make? And, and the reason New Zealand has been held up as an example is because we've used strategies like this. They have worked for us before, but we've always adapted to what we've learned. And in between, when we had, uh, of course, the alpha variant, it made us step up our game plan again. Delta has been a game changer. We're responding to that. Our hope, of course, is to have to move away in the long term from lockdowns. But right now, with this variant and the way it behaves, the best thing we can do to get out of this as quickly as we can is to go hard. On Treasury modelling, I will leave that to Minister Robertson, who will also outline the uh, COVID support payments that will be available. Of course, that indicative seven-day decision triggers economic support for the country and affected businesses. But I will let him give you the money. If, if I may, I just canvass around. 
Uh, look, that has been, we've had initial conversations. Uh, the view was that we wanted to make sure that we were keeping both those coming in for vaccines safe and those who are vaccinating safe. 48 hours gives us an ability to explore, uh, as has already been done actually by our health workforce, they have been considering options like drive-through vaccination. We'll be looking at what extra protocols we may put in place to then resume our vaccination campaign. I think from what we've seen in Australia, it has caused a bit of an uptick uh, in take-up. Uh, we want to use the opportunity, if we can, to safely vaccinate people in the interim. Can I? We'll give you an update. <laughs> but just add, add to that, in, of course, this early phase of, uh, of this outbreak, the most important thing is to stop the outbreak. And the best way to do that is to stop any unnecessary movement that could see interactions in the spread of the virus. Uh, the the uh, approach, of course, in Sydney and New South Wales to surge up vaccination is because they are using that to help control a much bigger outbreak. Uh, that our teams have been working on ways to safely vaccinate. It may not take 48 hours. We will update that tomorrow. They're working on it already. Okay, no, just canvassing who I haven't taken questions from. Do you have any indication, document, of, of the number of, of contacts at this stage? You mentioned that there were a few workplace contacts, but yes. not, not many. So it looks like. Yes, it looks like a handful of close uh, close contacts, so household and workplace. But our experience, of course, and uh, with Delta and certainly what has happened in uh, Australia, and indeed the the one Delta community case we have had here previously, which was our visitor from Sydney early on in the Sydney outbreak, is that very transient ex um, uh, exposure can lead to someone being infected. So, in a sense, there's less distinction between a close and a casual contact, and that's the approach we're taking. Also, what's material in this case relative to, obviously, the case in Wellington is source identification. Uh, we, as yet, do not know the source of this case. One of the um, clues that we will have, which in the past, back in those early days of our first lockdowns that we didn't have in the same way we do now is genome sequencing. Once we have that, it will give us a sense of whether or not we can trace it back to the border, to our managed isolation facilities in any cases there. If we aren't able to do that, that does raise some questions as to the source. But that will give us a strong link as to whether there are other people we need to worry about. Yes. 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 I'll make sure that the Minister Chris Hipkins makes contact with our tertiary education providers immediately. Um, of course, those who may be in a position or may choose to go into an area where they are able to um, uh, be in a bubble with their family, they may relocate in a short period of time. Uh, but we do need to make sure that people are doing so safely uh, and that we don't leave people in a position where they are not sheltered at all. Oh, Thank you. Is there any link to the Canadian naval ship um, that's been docked at Devonport? They didn't have to do MIQ and there was a... Problem. Ah, well, they did have to comply with an order which requires those individuals to have been uh, at sea for 14 days, vaccinated, double vaccinated and produced negative tests. Uh, and so that is part of our border order and they complied with that. Ashley. Yes, that, that's, that's correct, uh, Prime Minister. So that, that ship arrived on the 4th of August, left on the 11th of August, burst at the Port of Auckland. Uh, everyone, uh, the NZDF have told us that everyone who disembarked had tested negative for COVID-19 before they disembarked. All 250 personnel on board were vaccinated and had been at sea for 17 days. They did not dock in Devonport either. They docked, obviously, in Auckland. Well, I don't think at this stage we're going to rule anything out while we're still genome sequencing the case. But again, uh, no one on that ship tested positive. Everyone was double vaccinated and they'd been at sea for 17 days, which is longer than we would put them in MIQ. Jane. Can you remind people, please, about schools? What happens with kids? And yeah. What is the education ministry Look. doing to yes. support? Uh, education facilities are closed. Uh, in, previous, in the previous lockdown, we did stand up some support for uh, those who were essential workers. So obviously those who may be our essential health workers, um, uh, those who are working in our supermarkets, and those who are, for instance, part of our police or MIQ workforce um, now. Uh, that is not something that will, will be able to be stood up in three days. Uh, we, are, we will undertake work in the instance that we may be in a lockdown for a longer period of time in order to stand that up. Um, but again, reminder, educational facilities under level four close. Children are at home. Are you asking teachers to be very proactive 
about making sure that kids get yeah. what they need because yes. they have done this before. And they have done this before. And I know how hard it is, you know, and I say, you know, a huge thank you to our teachers, but also our parents. I, I absolutely understand what we are asking of them. Many of them try and work at home and be, become the supervisor and teacher as well. Um, we do have an expectation that schools will stand up the systems they've had in the past. Uh, and look, I point uh, to New Zealanders and parents in particular, TVNZ On Demand, if you have that capability, does still have the education channel available that was produced during the early days of lockdown with all of the resource there that I know many found helpful. Yeah, Henry. During the level four lockdown um, last year, there was not really the, much of an occurrence of the mask use, and there was definitely no yes. mandate for mask use. You, you said people should wear masks. Mask. We right. are asking people to wear masks. Uh, we have, uh, Cabinet has only very recently made some additional decisions around mandating in certain circumstance mask use. I'm going to give you an update over the next 24 hours on those decisions, but in the meantime, we are asking everyone, please, uh, as a courtesy, as an act of service to others, to look after yourself and others, please wear a mask when you go out. When it comes to mandated mask use, we'll give you an update tomorrow. Does that include while people are exercising outdoors? Yeah, look, again, we do want people to be really considerate of others. Just walking past or running past someone is a risk. If you are going to be engaging, for instance, in running where it's very difficult to wear a mask, make sure you are doing it in no proximity to anyone else because passing people is still a risk. Uh, so just use your common sense. Is it likely that in the next 48 hours you will mandate both mask use and QR code scanning for supermarket trips? Oh, if, if I may, I would rather come down with absolute clarity for you on the mandated areas, and I'll look to do that in the next 24 hours. As I say, Cabinet have made decisions but those then need to be drafted into orders rather than boring everyone with the detail of that. I would rather come down and give absolute clarity and just encourage you, if you step outside your house, pop a mask on. What, 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 is the, um, what would your message be to people who have immediately gone out right now and gone panic shopping? Uh, at, at every stage, people will have experienced that no matter what level we go into, we still have our supermarkets open. That has always been the case. And of course, people have been able to access local dairies too. There is no need to panic buy. Um, I, at this stage, have gotten used to the fact, though, that nothing I say overcomes human behaviour. We have a natural instinct, I think, that when alert level changes, um, people worry about their provisions. I will remind you again, you don't need to worry. They will be open, so please, just remember, other people need to buy things too. Be kind, be courteous. What about the, the, the rush on supermarkets, given the spread that we've seen yeah, in New South Wales and that essential work? System? It just doesn't make sense for people to rush out. It means you congregate. It means you create more risk. Um, if there are things you need to pick up, you know, give just a bit of time. Um, plan your trip. Uh, make sure that you only have that one person in the household going out. These are all things we've learnt before, and I do expect it will die down. Change have any impact on New Zealand Defence Force personnel? Finished Thank you for the question. We have had an explicit conversation on this. All orders that are being drafted for the 1159 Alert Level 4 will give an exclusion to the New Zealand Defence Force as it relates to the deployment of the C 130 into Afghanistan. So um, we do not expect um, that to be affected by this alert level change. Uh, our New Zealand Defence Force, um, for, for the most part, are double vaccinated, particularly those where they may be a risk at any point of them being deployed for an emergency. So I expect that they, those individuals being deployed will be vaccinated. How long is the departure test to, presumably? Uh, um, it would be more, of course, the entry into New Zealand. We know there are rates of COVID into the in places that they are going. But, of course, we'll think about the health considerations on their return, but we would have done that anyway. Prime Minister, why isn't there a plan? Why, yeah, sorry. Why isn't there a plan uh, for continuing the vaccination rollout at level four? Why do we need to pause it for so long? Uh, well, there is a view from our health officials that in the early stages, that actually, regardless, the most important thing is to try and reduce down uh, as much movement as possible in those critical stages. Our view, however, is that we can balance both of those things. But as you can imagine, all of our COVID vaccine sites are, a step, are set up in a particular way, maximise the floor plan, maximise the throughput. Uh, there has been work on preparation for these scenarios. Health were just briefing me on some of the thoughts that have been worked on around drive-throughs. But regardless, time is needed to put those in place. Why 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, uh, as the Prime Minister said, I'm going to give you a brief update around the uh, economic support responses, and I'm also in a position to give a, a, a brief update on the grid emergency uh, notice uh, that was issued earlier today by uh, Transpower as well. Uh, we know that from our recent experience that the best economic response continues to be a strong health response. What that's meant for New Zealand is that we have had our economy recover significantly faster than many other countries in the world. Uh, our GDP has returned to pre-COVID levels. Uh, employment is up, unemployment is down, businesses and export growth continue to be strong. In comparison to the rest of the world, our strong public health response has led to a strong economic response. And we will apply similar principles now to deal with the uncertainty that we are facing. Uh, we know we can do this, uh, we've done this before and we can do it again. Therefore, in terms of our uh, economic responses and consultation with the Minister of Social Development, the Honourable Carmel Cipollone, we are going to trigger the income support mechanisms that we have. The Prime Minister has indicated to you just shortly before this that Auckland is likely to be in alert level four for seven days. It is seven days that triggers uh, the uh, wage subsidy scheme, and in order to give certainty to our businesses and our workers, that is what we will be doing. Um, eligible employers anywhere in the country can apply for the wage subsidy scheme if they expect a loss of 40% of revenue as a result of the alert level increase. Uh, I want to note that the wage subsidy rates have been increased to reflect increases in wage costs since the scheme was first used in March 2020. Businesses will be eligible for $600 per week per full-time equivalent employee and $359 per week per part-time employee. Uh, the wage subsidy scheme will be paid as a two-week lump sum and otherwise core settings for the scheme will remain the same as they have previously and we'll put out more details on all of this tomorrow. I'm sure you can understand we've made this decision uh, rapidly uh, today. Also, eligible businesses anywhere in the country can apply for the resurgence support payment. So this is the payment that applies whatever alert levels uh, increases we see if they incur a loss of 30% of revenue as a result of that alert level increase. To remind you, the resurgence support payment is worth up to $1,500 uh, per employee plus plus $400 up to a max, sorry, it's worth $1,500 plus $400 per full-time employee up to a maximum of 50 full-time employees. So this was the scheme that we had in place with the recent Wellington uh, alert level change. It is different from the wage subsidy scheme. It does not have to be applied directly towards wages. This can be used for other costs that businesses have. Therefore, businesses are able to avail themselves of both the wage subsidy scheme and uh, the resurgence support scheme. Uh, businesses will be able to apply for the wage subsidy scheme at the Work and Income website and the Resurgence Support Scheme at the Inland Revenue Works uh, website. At this stage, we'll be looking to open applications for the wage subsidy support scheme from Friday, uh, this Friday, the 20th of August, um, and we expect payments would be normally be able to reach applicants within three days of applying. Uh, Inland Revenue is working to open the resurgence support payment for applications as soon as possible, but likely early next week. Can I just note at this point our thanks to, again, the staff at the Ministry of Social Development in particular and Inland Revenue. They do have done a magnificent job in dealing with these schemes in the past and they are ready to go to get things going, but obviously it does take a few days uh, to set things up and that's the process that we're moving into now. I also want to note, uh, of course, that the Leave Support Scheme and the Short Term Absence Scheme, both which are designed for people who either have COVID or have had to take time off in order to get test results, are both still in operation and still available for people uh, to be able to access. Uh, as I said, we'll have more information over the next 24 hours on some of the detail of that, but we wanted to provide certainty today to people so that they know. I will just talk about the grid emergency notice if you like, and then we'll come to uh, questions uh, on on the uh, uh, income support measures. So as uh, most of you will be aware, uh, Transpower issued a grid emergency notice uh, this evening. This was as a result of a conductor wire falling from a tower around State Highway 7 in the Wicker Pass area in North Canterbury. I want to note there's no indication that anyone was harmed uh, when this occurred. Uh, what this has meant is that uh, it has triggered the need for that notice. Um, clearly, those of you who will be aware of the significant contribution South Island Power makes 
to the powering of the North Island, uh, it means that this reduced uh, almost by half the amount of power that was able to come across the, the Cook Strait cable. That is the reason for the emergency notice being issued. Uh, as you'll be aware, and there have been a number of media releases made by uh, by uh, generators tonight. They are working hard to bring on extra generation capacity. Uh, there's been an excellent response from generators and indeed from the industry more broadly, as there has from those who provide uh, power directly to consumers. Uh, for this evening, the situation appears to be stable. Um, there's been a use by uh, providers of what is called ripple control, um, so that's rather using things like uh, modulating hot water rather than there being a need for any particular power outage, and thus far this evening uh, that appears to have been uh, successful. In terms of the uh, the wire itself, there are crews on site tonight. Uh, they are going to be working uh, as much as they can this evening, but as you possibly also understand, it's work that requires daylight, and so they'll continue that work tomorrow. Uh, at this stage, the advice I have is they, they are confident that they'll be able to uh, get that back up and running fully within the next 48 hours, hopefully earlier than that, but uh, within the next 48 hours. Um, as a result of that, there will be continuing work done over this uh, evening and into tomorrow to manage tomorrow evening's peak as well. Uh, and as long as there are no uh, equipment or plant failures around the country, then we're confident that we will be able to get through this. Minister, how much is, is it really likely to be a case of a peak tomorrow when you've got the whole country staying at home using the power all day? Yeah. Look, and as I said, there's always an evening peak, and clearly we're going to have a, uh, that there. There will be, obviously, an increased load, I'm sure, during the day. Again, I am confident from the advice I have had that the industry has come on board. All the generators are looking at putting all the generation they can. We no longer have uh, the concern that we did around weeds in one of uh, Genesis's uh, plants, and so that's uh, able to operate. I believe also, even in the time we've been sitting in the press conference here tonight, that uh, the third rank in, at Huntley is going to be fired up. So I'm very confident we have the capacity to deal with the fact that, yes, this is an unfortunate coincidence with the country moving to a level four. Do you have or just let Jenna finish this. And then in terms I'll, of the economic modelling that has been done um, for, for this lockdown, I think the last costing was done was a week at level three was going to cost $500 million. Yep. What are we looking at? So um, I'll just give you the numbers I've got here, and the scenario we're looking at with the seven days and the three days doesn't quite fit with the numbers, but you'll be able to see the range. So uh, for a week for alert level four uh, across the whole country, uh, the cost is estimated to be $1.5 billion. Uh, um, for alert level four and then alert level three in the rest of the country, um, it's around $920 million. So somewhere in that range there is what you can expect. I do think it's very important to note that while that is a significant cost to the economy, the long-run benefit of stamping COVID out now quickly is well and truly uh, eclipses any of that cost. But that's the range that uh, we have at the moment. Jane. Got, you've got five billion dollars left in the COVID fund. On these figures, you know you would have wriggle room. But when, it, how much when it gets extended, are you going to start to run into problems and have to go and borrow more? How long is it going to last? Yeah, five well, I've given uh, that's that's the economic cost to the country. That's not the cost of the scheme per se. And obviously, the cost of the scheme. Uh, per se, depends on how many people apply for it. Um, obviously, we've got around that $5 billion figure there. But I've always said that if it is necessary to borrow more money to be able to get New Zealanders through this, we'll do that. The great news is that the New Zealand economy has outperformed all of the expectations, and we are in a stronger position. Obviously, I'm not in a position today to give you the exact update on debt levels, but we're in a much stronger position than we expected to be. So New Zealand has the capacity to deal with this. We know that this approach worked for us last time. The wage subsidy scheme worked for us last time. We now also have the resurgent support payment, and I'm confident it'll do so again. So, Jason. Are, these, so are these figures just the, econo the straight econo economic loss, so you then had to add on the cost of any wage subsidy, any resurgence payments onto the on top of these? Well, it depends how, what you want to measure, but that is, that's the modelling that tells us that's the output that's lost in the economy. 
um, that's, it's not quite comparable to then, because not all of that comes to the government, so it's not quite a comparable number in terms of saying you have to add it together. But that's not the cost of the wage subsidy scheme, that's the cost of the loss of output. Jason. Could you give us um, an indication about what this decision today means for the um, OCR review tomorrow? Is that still going to go ahead or is that on hold? Um, I, I spoke to the Reserve Bank Governor earlier this evening and got an indication from him that they will go ahead with their announcement tomorrow, but I imagine given uh, the alert level change, that's likely not to be an in-person announcement, but you'd need to ask him about and that. Fact. I mean, there were a lot of economists forecasting a bit of a rate rise. This puts a spanner in the work. Have you given any advice? I know <laughs> statutory independent, that sort of jazz. But is there any sort of <laughs> guidance that you've given the, the governor in terms of... I, the economic it's impact? not my place to give the governor guidance on those matters. Did the government consider uh, putting the uh, wage subsidy across the entire country rather than just, just for Auckland? It is available across the entire country. So the change that we made last year when we reassessed the wage subsidy scheme is that no matter where an alert level rises to alert level three or four, the wage subsidy is available across the country. What you have to demonstrate is that the alert level increase has caused the 40% reduction in revenue. Thomas. Are there plans Thomas. for further impress supply if you, if you need to, to go to Parliament for the authority to borrow? Supply? There definitely won't be a need for that. If you recall, the, I can't recall the exact number in the impress supply bill that we did the other day, but it was a significant amount of money, and we always, as we say there, it's not a target, it's a limit, um, and we certainly gave ourselves um, sufficient space within that. Sorry, yes, we'll come down the front. Have you considered industry-specific payments? So, for instance, like hospitality, there's going to be a lot of food wastage coming up, mm. especially in those No, look, we haven't. Obviously, this has been a very rapid um, set of decisions. Um, one of the reasons we brought in place the resurgence support payment was a recognition for businesses that that immediate alert level change can have an effect on the business. So that's really what that's designed for. Um, that can give, and I'm thinking of some of those hospitality businesses in Wellington, they know all about it because they recently accessed it. That can give up to $21,000 to a business. So that is our way of dealing with that issue. Back on the call to grant Um, I, I believe it was, and I don't think you can make a linkage between this and that particularly. Would you have, would you have, any, would you have any concerns if um, interest rates did go up? Um, and I guess the effect, the cooling effect that would have on top of this current COVID situation? As I say, it's not my practice, as you know, to comment on, on those matters. What I would say is that it's the job of the Reserve Bank to look to the medium term. As you know, that's exactly what they're asked to do. Uh, they've had throughout... COVID-19 had to balance short-term issues with medium and long-term uh, objectives, and I'm sure you'll hear more from uh, the Reserve Bank about that tomorrow. Is just take a couple more. Is it your assumption that you will be borrowing more money for this? At this stage, we don't need to. So in terms of, the, of, the, of what's likely, in terms of what was outlined tonight, the seven days in the Auckland area, three days in the rest of the country, we wouldn't need to. We've got more than enough money um, set aside. Uh, bear in mind that while we've got the money left over in the COVID response fund, we also have allocations for, for example, business support that have not been used. So the, the famous business finance guarantee scheme that I've stood on this podium and talked about a, a few times um, wasn't used to the extent that we expected it. So there's actually money left from earlier on that we haven't spent as well as the money we'd set aside. So no, at this point, I don't believe that's a realistic prospect. We would have to be in a period of level four for a, a long time for that to be an issue. Bernard. Would you, would you, um, what would you say to those businesses thinking of taking the um, resurgence payment and the wage subsidy and whether they should take that immediately if this is only short term? Yeah, the, the first thing I'd say is one of the changes we made um, since we initially did this was that there is a much greater emphasis now on the fact that it is the alert level change that needs to have caused your revenue drop. And that, you know, following on from the report of the Auditor General and others, we will, you know, there will be more pursuit of whether or not that is an accurate uh, statement to be made. Um, I repeat what I said in the very early days of standing up here, if you make a statutory declaration to that effect and it is not true and you knew it wasn't true, that is fraud. And so that message is clear. I think what we've seen, when bear in mind we had August as well and then we had February 
uh, August last year and then we had February this year. We've got a bit more experience and we see that the take up is not as high as businesses do take that time. Uh, bear in mind also the resurgent support payment um, caps out for, for uh, firms at 50 FTEs. What happened to the resurgent, Sorry, to Jason. the resurgent support payment, um, yep. I'm sorry That's 30. I know there's a difference between the two, but we could get into the reasons, but that's a 30% reduction in revenue for the resurgent support payment. But it's not tied to wages in the way that the wage subsidy scheme is, and this is issues around things like rents and so on, which we've had in the past. Jason, I'll just take a couple more. Did you, perchance, mutter any select four-letter four words where you've got the news that Transpower was happening at the same time as this um, COVID outbreak? I mean, that uh, can't have been good. Um, there might have been more than one uh, four-letter word uttered at that point. It is an unhappy coincidence. But again, as I noted, I think that partly in light of what occurred last week, um, for a different, you know, this is a very specific set of reasons around a, a particular cable uh, going down in the, in the South Island. Um, I think the response has been good from what I've read tonight from all parts of the sector, from generators, from industry, from retailers. And so, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're in a strong position here, but quite clearly not uh, the coincidence we were looking for this evening. Can you guarantee Kiwis that they're going to be able to turn on their power at home while they're stuck? We're doing absolutely everything we can to make that happen, and I believe that on the basis of what we've seen tonight, uh, from the response from everybody, that we're in a very strong position to give that assurance. We will no doubt be giving more updates about this over the next couple of days. Not good enough, Thank though, is it? Because if people are in lockdown, they need to be able to... Of course, Tova, and the, and the point here is that we are doing everything we can. Um, it, you know, we lost a wire on... Um, a very important poll in the South Island that was not expected. Um, everybody is now doing the right thing, and tonight we're all here, the lights are on, and I'm very optimistic the same will happen. Of course it's not something that any of us would want at this situation. We'll keep everybody updated, and as long as everybody plays their part, I'm very confident there won't be a problem. Yes, Thanks, Thanks everybody. In addition to that third ranking, yep. I don't suppose you know off the top of your head any other power that's being turned on and any other parts that are being fired up? Um, off the top of my head, I don't. I don't. What I have had an assurance is that um, from all of the generators that I've seen, they're putting everything available in. So obviously the problem last week was there was available um, generation that wasn't put in. Uh, the feedback I'm seeing is that everything that is available is, and obviously um, with the third ranking coming on, that takes some time, um, but that should help deal with concerns that people might have about the coming days of this week. Well, we always want people to be careful with their consumption of energy, but no, what we're doing at the moment is managing that via the generators and via the distributors. That's what ripple control is about. But we always want people to no, I don't. I'm not saying that. People need to stay warm. They need to um, be comfortable in their homes this evening. We have a process for managing this, which takes place at the generator point of view and at the distributor point of view with the regulators on top of it. That's the process we're using. And this evening, it's working, and I'm confident it'll work tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.